Hello and welcome to RG Boo, an extra spooky edition of the official podcast of Robert Gordon University. And that's enough of that voice. I am your host, Johnny Milne, and we are celebrating Halloween by taking a dive into the world of the supernatural. It's a real treat, not a trick, to welcome our very first returning guest, It's Dr. Rachel Ironside. Rachel, you really are a glutton for punishment. Thank you for joining me again. Thank you for having me. Well, I think we should pick up right where we left off several months ago now. You have a PhD in paranormal experiences. What is it that drew you to study the supernatural in the first place? I think I've always had an interest uh, in the supernatural. I, to be honest, never really thought about studying it uh, when I first became a student. So I did my undergraduate at uh, the University of Aberdeen, Mm -hmm. if we're allowed to say that. Oh, no, we're we're friends. Uh, Good, good. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And at that time, um, when I was studying, it was around the same time that things like uh, Most Haunted became particularly popular and all of these kind of tourism businesses around looking for ghosts were, were starting up and when I came to my dissertation topic um, I'd I'd been a little bit involved with some of these uh, sort of businesses and uh, and these sort of subcultures involved around that Um, and I thought I'd quite like to do my dissertation subject on these so because I was doing management I decided to focus on um, why people might like to buy these kind of experiences and and go on them so I did my undergraduate dissertation um, in that area and that kind of sparked a little bit of an interest I went to a conference um, that summer and met who became my PhD supervisor down at the University of York um, and had some discussions with him and uh, and kind of got to know a little bit about what the possibilities were of studying this area and became a member of the Anomalous Experience Research Unit, which I'm still an associate member of. Sounds very (laughs) X-Files. Not quite as exciting as it maybe (laughs) seems. Um, And I did my my PhD uh, looking at how people make sense of uncanny or paranormal experiences. So so that's kind of how it came about and the rest is history, as they say. And um, obviously your current research focus is supernatural tourism. what kind of an influence can a ghost story or like a monster tale have on a building or a region? I think what's really important is that um, to sort of remember that these stories are really part of our folklore. So they've been around for a very, very long time and people have been interested in them for a very long time as well. And, and they're very intertwined with history and, and with heritage. And ghost stories, um, they're not often scary stories for the sake of being scary stories they're often very much intertwined with um, tales around a sort of morality around our past around the sort of darker details of human endeavors and our, and our history and and often tell stories about um, how we should sort of live a better life so to speak and I think in a society that is kind of moved or somewhat removed um, more these days from our community, from place, from these kind of things. Ghost stories allow that kind of connection with it. So they're a really interesting way for people to learn about our past and um, and, our, and our heritage. And the other thing that they do is they help to re-enchant places as well. So okay. uh, people would think we, we live in a more disenchanted uh, world these days, very much um, with technology and science and and these sort of areas um, and what ghost stories do is they help to re-enchant places and we find that organisations and destinations are very aware of this these days so they use um, ghost stories and tales to attract people and to engage people with uh, with those places and we see this all over the world so uh, Dracula tourism brings in over a hundred thousand people a year of to course, Romania yeah. um, and of course we have um, many other things across the UK like ghost tours and things like that and they're hugely popular so you get these big sold out of events related to the supernatural so they can be massive economic boosts as well and are there any particular you you mentioned Dracula obviously in Scotland we've got Nessie with Loch Ness Um, are there any other particular examples that you've looked into that stand out as say don't know if it's the best word to use but like really successful examples of a place using a story like this I think, to be honest, I think the Loch Ness monster is a really one yeah. good one to go back to because it's it's you know obviously ties into um, where we are locally in Scotland um, and you know that's a, the 
attractiveness around that um, it started to be sold in sort of 1933. So um, the first guy who, who reported seeing Nessie, he was actually a, a part-time journalist, and mm. um, him and his wife were driving past Loch Ness and they saw a what they described as a monster. So this was the first time it become known as the Loch Ness Monster, um, toodling across the road with an animal in its mouth and sort of jumping into the loch. And, and he reported this, and then suddenly people started to come to Loch Ness and, um, and see this. And, uh, you know, the, the most recent report, I think it came out in September, was that um, the Loch Ness Monster is worth over £41 million pounds each year <laughs> to the local economy. So it, it, it's a massive boost for, for Scotland to have mm. the Loch Ness Monster. Um, last year was the record sightings of the Loch Ness Monster, so it's still oh, seen a lot. Eight times it's been seen this year <laughs> as well. Um, but I, I've always found, I mean, my interest is in a sort of ghost tourism, which mm. has become a massive industry recently. So, um, you know, we uh, I always like the creativity around ghost tourism. So not only do we get ghost walks and sort of ghost hunts these days, you get ghost tour buses down in, in Edinburgh course, and, yeah. and York. You get the, the ghost boats, which you can go on around in, in various locations. Um, and, and these days you get sort of haunted museums. You can go and see these sort of ghostly objects and, mm. and those sort of things. Um, one of the... Uh, ones I'm always very interested in how these stories have a sort of impact on society as well um, and one of the stories that really interests me came from Iceland um, okay. so they have um, what they call their hidden folk so um, elves and trolls and um, associated with the kind of culture of Iceland and again their heritage um, have, have done things like block uh, new roads being built on on Iceland wow, because okay, of the yeah. concern that the new roads being built is actually going to interfere with the with the hidden folk um, so that plays a massive role again in their culture and you can go to Iceland and go on elf walks and mm -hmm. go to elf school School, if you want right. to, yeah, <laughs> if that's of interest. <laughs> um, do you ever find that there's a, a difference in impact between, like, the say the nice supernatural stories, like you know Iceland, like you just said, or Nessie, compared to the more horrific, ghostly, scary ones? Yeah, I, d I think this is a really interesting area to to kind of look at. Actually, um, I mean, scary places are popular, and I think um, ghosts are often about um, selling possibilities. So the possibility that something might happen, and um, darker places tend to increase that possibility mm -hmm. for people so you tend to find places with a, a dark history um, so for instance Peterhead Prison that's somewhere that started to sell itself on its kind of ghost stories um, are hugely popular um, with uh, with people that want to go in and potentially experience that and one of the shifts we have seen recently um, with these kind of events is um, not only just darker locations but also darker experiences and people okay. um, being interested in those so um, for instance there's uh, ghost hunting is one of the uh, forms of tourism that you can do so you go and spend the night in a haunted building and potentially Not looking for experience <laughs> Um, there's a, a location down in England called Drakelow Tunnels, um, and they've got uh, various stories attached to there. It's an old um, uh, military base, and um, one of the stories is that after it was decommissioned, um, satanic worship used to happen there. And there's okay. all these stories um, that people have had experiences of hearing um, hoofed feet walking around the corridors and things. And they, they host events through the year, um, and they're sold out every time, oh, which wow, okay. you think is kind of ironic. You think you wouldn't want to experience that but these darker experiences are definitely of interest okay. to people. Um, well a couple of months ago you brought researchers from all over the world to RGU for a Supernatural in Contemporary Society conference. So can you tell us just a bit more about say that, how it came about and what your hopes were when you set it all up? Yeah, so I think um, there's a couple of interesting things about the supernatural and contemporary society. So firstly, um, there's a persistence to it. So uh, studies that have been done um, looking at how many people believe in the supernatural consistently show that over half of us still have some sort of supernatural belief. Uh, and other studies also show that over two-fifths of the UK population um, have had some sort of supernatural experience. So even in our modern world, we're still having these experiences and we're still believing mm. in them as well. Um, and then there's also the kind of representation. So when we look at popular culture, we look at media, we look at TV programmes, um, magazines, music, the supernatural still really features in all of those. So one of the aims of the conference was to look at the supernatural in this kind of contemporary context and also look at it within the school 
School of Creative and Cultural Business and the kind of subjects that we we uh, look at there. So tourism, events, uh, journalism, media, and all of these areas. And what were the kinds of things that um, the different researchers brought to the conference? So we had international researchers from all over the world um, talking on various different topics. So we had keynotes from the likes of Professor Dennis Waskell, who um, is a a researcher from the States. Um, And he was talking to us about um, the kind of promise of the supernatural and its um, relevance to academic research. Uh, We had Dr. David Clark, who is a reader down at Sheffield University. And he was talking about his work in the National uh, UFO Archive Project and his work as a journalist within that and looking at how UFO sightings are linked to journalism and what people um, kind of report and then we looked at a whole range of topics from supernatural tourism through to the way that the supernatural is represented in TV and media so looking at the sort of television ghost story uh, through to exploring it um, in subcultures so we had uh, Professor Christopher Bader who talked about the Bigfoot subculture and how people either look at that from a sort of spiritual perspective or look at it from a scientific perspective Um, and then we also explored uh, things like methodologies around studying the supernatural and um, and the different kind of areas that it exists within academic research. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I'll, I'll be honest, Rachel, like, the supernatural is an area I've always been interested in, interested in sorry, from you know, films, books, TV shows, visiting different places. I was actually just pretty recently down in Edinburgh. I saw the ghost tour bus, as you said, went and spent some time in uh, Greyfriars Kirkyard which, at night, which was mm-hmm. not fun. But... Um, <laughs> Has it always been an interest of yours, um, you know, from an early age, or did something happen to spark this in you? Yeah, I mean, I I think I have always been interested in it, to be honest. I think um, the mysteries of the world have always fascinated me, and um, I think it's never been enough to look at the world in black and white. Mm -hmm. I always think it's it's interesting, and I've always found people's experiences and their encounters with the supernatural and their stories about ghosts and and the like uh, really interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, So it has always been a fascination, and I equally grew up with classic horror movies like The Lost Boys and American Werewolf in London and alien and, and all of these things so I'm pretty sure that's probably responsible for my interest in it as well Okay, uh, I'm with you on all of those um, <laughs> and I, I happen to know you mentioned earlier right at the start that you were involved in some of the businesses around this area I happen to know that you also used to run your own haunted walking tours around Aberdeen um, in preparation for this interview one of my colleagues Danielle gave me a book about haunted Aberdeen and there's a picture of you in there. <laughs> yeah. um, so what exactly did that involve I mean for you and for the people that came and joined yeah. you on them? Well I did that very smart thing that in my final year of studying um, as an undergraduate I decided to set up my own business because of course as any fourth year I'm sure will realise at this point in time that's always a good thing to spend your time oh, doing. Yeah. There's plenty of uh, time. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, so I, I wanted to set up my own company and I, I realised there was a bit of a gap in Aberdeen for um, the possibility to learn about history and learn about the heritage of of Aberdeen um, and to do that in a kind of a fun and interesting way and also to hear about the kind of ghost stories because Aberdeen's got this incredibly rich really quite dark history associated Mm -hmm. with it um, and got some really good ghost stories as well so um, so I set up um, ghost walks um, in the city and we started at Castlegate uh, and we stopped at various locations around uh, the city centre ending at the Old Green um, talking about the ghost stories and the kind of darker side um, of of the city. Um, well, I obviously know about Jake, the ghost at mm-hmm. Smashley Theatre, who obviously watches on during our graduations. Um, there's Marshall College and things that happen there. But uh, were there any areas or stories from your tours that were of would be of particular interest? Yeah, there's was, there was one story that I remember that um, I thought was really interesting just because it was a little bit different, actually, and it, it came from Provost Skeen's house, oh, um, okay, yeah. which is behind that big new building um, that's gone up. Um, and they have in um, Provost Skeen's house this beautiful painted gallery up at the top, and it's really worth a visit because it's, it's really uh, very pretty. Um, and I remember one of the staff telling me that one night after hours, they went up to the painted gallery. They were just doing a sort of final check of the building. Um, Notice the door was closed and inside the gallery, they could hear all this noise coming from inside. So people speaking and laughing and moving around and um, as if there was a function. <laughs> going on and they thought this was rather strange because they hadn't been told that there was going to be an event going on in the painted gallery so they went back downstairs to the office to check and see if there was an event going on they hadn't been
been told about, um, and there wasn't. So they went back upstairs thinking this is rather odd, um, got to the door of the painted gallery, went to open it and found that the room was completely empty. Oh, fun. So yeah, so technically there was a ghost party going on at Provost Schemes, which I always thought was was rather nice. Yeah, it shows us good things to look forward to, I guess. Well, yes, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I mean, for our own uh, students or staff listening in, do we have any of our own RGU-based ghost stories that you're aware of at all? Yeah, sadly I haven't actually heard of any ghost stories from Robert Gordon University or from our campus. Come um, up with one, I guess. Well, yeah, well, maybe maybe there's a, a creative um, <laughs> possibility there for I mean, someone. I, I'll be 100% honest for it, for yourself or obviously for anyone listening. The um, When you go into Garthy House and there's the new paintings that are up on either side of the hall, one of which is a painting of a little girl and even you know, eight o'clock in the morning, bright <laughs> sunshine. That picture terrifies me. Well, I was going to say the only thing I've ever heard from RGU, and not to spook you out, Johnny, mm. but that nice. the one place <laughs> that I've heard a couple of people say that they felt slightly uncomfortable was in Garsty House. Um, and just the sense of sometimes not quite feeling like they're alone or mm. feeling like they're being watched. So, I mean, yes. I know I always feel uncomfortable in there, but that could just be because I'm meant to be doing work. Maybe. And... <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever had any of your own experiences you couldn't, say, quite explain away? Yes. So I had an experience which has always kind of stuck with me. And again, maybe another reason that I sort of got into studying um, Mm. this area um, is when I was younger, I um, used to work um, when I was about 16, 17 at at horse riding stables before I um, came to university. Um, And we would sometimes um, take horses down to the borders. um, And this one time we'd gone down um, with a a horse to drop it with its owners. And we stayed in a a local hotel. And and I can't remember the name of this hotel. I was quite young and I didn't check at the time. It frustrates me still to this day (laughs) that I I haven't looked into it. Um, But we went to bed that night and um, as I was going to sleep um, I felt like the covers were tugged and being someone who'd watched quite a lot of horror movies by Mm. that point I sat up and I turned every light on in the room because this is what they don't do in horror movies so my first reaction was light on TV on bedside lights on every Mm. light went on in the room Um, and I sat back in the bed um, and I felt very strange It, it, it was quite an odd feeling in the room and then I saw what looked like a kind of outline of something run across the bottom of the bed towards the window and it wasn't like there was a sort of physical thing there it was just almost like a pencil outline of this hunched over small thing run Mm -hmm. across the room Um, and uh, I freaked out I ran out the room the bathroom was separate to the room and I spent most of the night in the bathroom until I got up the courage to ask the friend that I was traveling with to come and sleep in the spare room that was Mm -hmm. in the bedroom that I was in because I was I was really scared at what I'd seen Um, the next morning we went down and we asked if it was if there was anything odd in the hotel and they went oh yeah no it, there is but it's not in your room so don't worry didn't think anything more of it um, until the person that I was with looked into it and it turns out there's a hunched over uh, dwarf ghost that haunts the building oh, and nice. I have to say it was hearing that afterwards that was even more freaky because it's sort of related to the experience that yeah had, the al- so. almost confirmed yeah, yeah so. um, well Finally, it wouldn't be Halloween if we didn't end on a spooky story. You've obviously told us a good few stories so far, but Dr. Rachel Ironside, please, can you tell us an eerie tale that's got the, t- the hairs on the back of your neck standing up? Okay, well, when you asked me about this, I was trying to think of, there's so many good ghost stories from, from Scotland and around this area in particular, but um, there's one particularly um, sort of unusual experience or encounter that I thought would be would be good to talk about, because it definitely was one that, that I thought was particularly freaky. Um, and it comes from the Cairn Gorms. Um, so I think if anyone's been walking in the Cairn Gorm Mountains, you'll probably know that it can be quite an eerie place <laughs> and fairly isolated and wild, but... There's a story connected to um, Ben McDewey, which is the second highest mountain in Scotland, um, and uh, and it's of the big grey man of Ben McDewey. And this ghost, or this, this uh, figure, has been seen by a number of people that have climbed um, on Ben McDewey. Um, and it's 
considered to be almost the Bigfoot of Scotland okay. or our own kind of Bigfoot, although it seems to have a more sort of spiritual or ethereal um, connection to it. Um, so the the experience goes um, that most people will they'll be climbing up Ben Macdui usually on their own. Um, and they start to feel like they're not on their own anymore and they get this sort of creepy feeling um, as if they're being stalked. So it's quite a negative feeling that's attached to it. And then often the mist will will roll in and they'll start to hear footsteps accompanying their own footsteps walking um, along the ridge of mm. the mountain. And then they get this intense feeling of terror and sometimes they'll see this figure coming through the mist, this tall, usually about three meters high with long legs and long arms appearing through the mist and then they'll, they'll feel this intense sense of dread and usually run back down the mountain. And I wanted to share, so there's, um, this has been cited for over 100 years, so there's lots of sightings associated with it, and I thought it would be interesting to share one of the very first sightings that was reported, and it was reported by a guy named uh, Professor Normal um, Colley, who had his experience in the late 1800s, but um, he shared it with the Cairngorm Club in 1925, and I thought I would just read you his account, because I think it's particularly creepy. Please do. So, Professor Norman Colley says, I was returning from the cairn on the summit in a mist when I began to think I heard something else than merely the noise of my own footsteps. Every few steps I took, I heard a crunch, and then another crunch, as if someone was walking after me, but taking steps three or four times the length of my own. I said to myself, this is all nonsense. I listened and heard it again, but could see nothing in the mist. As I walked on and the eerie crunch, crunch sounded behind me, I was seized with terror and took to my heels, staggering blindly among the boulders for four or five miles, nearly down to Red Murcher's forest. Whatever you make of it, I do not know, but there is something very queer about the top of Ben Macdui. I will not go back there again by myself, I know. Well, you don't need any more than that, I think. <laughs> that is fantastic, Rachel Ironside. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween to you too. And that's it for this spooky episode of RGU Talk. On behalf of the university, I'm Johnny Milne, and we will talk to you later. <laughs>